All right, everybody. My name is Angel Lee. I worked here at Chenard's for the last two going on three years. Before that, I graduated from Oregon State University with a degree in agriculture. And um, I'm very passionate about getting people excited about growing plants. So I really like to take these opportunities to talk about um, gardening vegetables, where to begin, because it's a lot easier than you might think it is. Um, with that being said, I'll go ahead and share my screen and get started. Uh, if anyone has any questions, feel free to put them in the chat box or speak it out, out loud. Um, all righty, starting a vegetable garden. We're going to be really starting with the basics today. I'm going to be assuming that We've never planted any vegetables before, so I'm going to try to go pretty basic, but also include some extra information. So if you've been growing vegetables, this won't be such a snore. Um, again, if you have any questions, just go ahead and ask, um, unmute yourself, ask. Uh, questions are going to be extremely welcome, so it's just going to go on to a good conversation. Uh, first, we're going to get started with what is a vegetable garden. Uh, growing vegetables, either for subsistence or supplemental for your grocery bill. It's easier than you might think, so please don't feel discouraged. Um, you're going to, it's a learning curve, you know, um, and you might surprise yourself what you're capable of. It's good for your mental health and your physical health to get out there, get your hands in the dirt and see, nurture things and see how they grow. So where can I do a vegetable garden? Anywhere you can. Uh, you'll see them in the ground, in raised beds, in containers, greenhouses, wherever you got. Uh, here at the garden center, we had some really nice raised beds for a little bit. I was talking about we were growing some really cool melons in there last year at home. I have absolutely no land. I have a front porch, so I do a lot of container gardening. And I don't let it stop me that I have no land and just a tiny little four by four porch. I've got like four blueberries, four roses, <laughs> at least four shrubs. Um, and this year I'm taking home a cherry tree. So that might be a little ambitious, but we'll see what I'm getting into. I like to do a tomato at least every year too. Um, with the container gardening, I can find vegetables can be a little demanding, especially when I spend all day here at the garden center taking care of all these plants. So here, I try not to get myself too overwhelmed, but I love blueberries and I love blueberries and strawberries. <clears throat> so vegetables, what can we grow? Vegetables, annuals that are gonna die off every year, like lettuces, radishes, broccoli, chard, peas, and kale, or perennials like artichoke, asparagus, rhubarb, and horseradish that will continue to grow on through the years. Much more long-term. Uh, when? Anytime. So right now we're looking at this first bullet point is spring, moving into summer crops. The plants you're planting with, working with right now are gonna have to be a little bit frost tolerant and we're gonna see them harvesting in the summer. After this, we're gonna be moving into the more heat tolerant um, slash loving Heat loving crops like your tomatoes, your melons, that you're gonna, then going to be harvesting closer to the fall. So as for spring summer crops, what we're looking at right now, we're looking at things like beets, broccoli, cabbage, carrots, cauliflower, onions, peas, potatoes, and radishes. All of these things have a little bit of a degree of uh, frost tolerance. However, if we get a hard frost, they might require some protection and some thinking about. So I've got a couple of points here. A single bullet or a little asterisk can, are things that can be directly seeded mid-March. Double asterisks can be seeded early as January and February. Um, 
The rest must be started indoors around January for transplant mid-March. So if you haven't got started um, about those ones that needed to be seeded closer to January, don't worry, we've got starts here at the garden center you can purchase and get started going. Uh, here's a little bed example of some winter crops um, you might see, things like kale and cabbage are great in the colder months. Summer crops are going to be things like tomatoes, cucumbers, peppers, squash, your greens, lettuces, beans, melons, and corn for sure. Our last average frost date in Oregon is April 15th. Um, that's an average that's not set in stone. So again, we're gonna have to keep an eye on the weather and have a frost protection plan in place at this time of year. So we can still, I don't know. Is it just too late your way to end them? These are things you're probably going to be start start seeding indoors at this time. They're very sensitive to cold, um, and you, you don't really don't want to get these things into the ground until that after April fifteenth time, unless you've got a special structure, a greenhouse, some heating, some something extra to keep them happy. They're very cold sensitive. And even though sometimes with things like those summer crops, you might think you're getting a earlier start by putting them in a cold ground, mm -hmm. but sometimes waiting until the ground's actually warm, you'll see a faster growth rate in the long term. So fall winter crops, um, things with an asterisk will overwinter for spring harvest, things like garlic, onions, and shallots. Um, other things that are pretty, Cold tolerant are gonna be things like leeks, beets, Brussels sprouts, kohlrabi, radish, broccoli, and cabbage. So our focus for talking today, will be talking about the transition from winter crops into the more spring and summer crop, crops. We'll talk a little bit about the importance of cleaning the garden. Um, we're mostly going to be focusing on annuals that are going to die back um, that you will switch out come spring, um, summer, fall. And we'll talk about some of the challenges with navigating climate and weather in our area. As we know, we've got beautiful days like this where we're getting anxious. The sun's out. We want to get to the gardening, but we also know that here in a couple of days, we might see a freezing, <laughs> some freezing weather. So. We gotta be flexible at this time. I've got some pictures here of a transitional area. This is what we had growing over the cold winter. We've got chard um, and cabbage. It looks like some lettuce. I think we actually had a high tunnel over the lettuce parts um, to, or a harvest guard to protect them from frosts. And then this is right after I pulled that off to then clean it out and clear it out for things like some more kale and some peas. So you might be thinking, where do I start? I'd like to recommend you do the yourself the favor and plan a little bit. Maximize the, this way you can maximize the use of your area, maximize your yield and productive, productivity while minimizing your effort. I would like to recommend one of these. It is a really cool calendar. Um, gardening, Oregon Gardening Guide for the Willamette Valley. So it's extremely specific to our area and it breaks the year down month by month. And it tells you uh, what to plan, what to plant, what to propagate, spray, prune, fertilize. They, it really can't get any more simpler than this. And it's got notes for keeping track of what you're doing. Uh, it's only $14.99. Helps you keep yourself accountable and keeps you planning and excited for the future. Sometimes I feel like you can run into like a little bit of a wall where you're like, okay, what do I do now? That breaks it down so you never have to question yourself what season it is. So what is your area available to you? What kind of sun are you working with? How much space do you have for mature plants? And what do you want, or where are you going to be growing 
you want containers, raised beds, are you gonna be doing it in the ground? Um, I would recommend planning uh, to clean and amend before you start planting. And think about how you're gonna get water to your bed in the dead of, dead of summer. Um, are you gonna be willing to hike five gallons of water a couple, like a half mile away from your house? Or do you have a hose you can just bust out and spray right there? It's water is extremely important to vegetable during the growing season. In the dead of summer, things can get quite thirsty. Figure out what you want to grow, what is important to you, um, what can you handle, space and labor. Like I said, I kind of back off on vegetables a little bit at my house, especially leafy greens, because um, they're, you know, I don't want to be thinking about them all the time, thinking about insects and whatnot. However, I'll do a tomato, because I can, I can stand one tomato at my place. I've got no land, but I can maybe do one tomato where I am. This year I'm thinking about doing peas um, as a functional purpose or maybe squash because um, they will grab and trellis. And I'm thinking about making a trellis up the side of my house to uh, help protect me from the sun come summer because my house gets extremely hot. <laughs> um, so they can have functional purposes as well as edible. Uh, when and how often do you want to harvest? Would you prefer to have annuals that are gonna die back or would you rather have a perennial that'll come back? Think about mature rates, what's gonna die when, um, and think about maybe a continual harvest or staggered planting it's sometimes called. I've got a really good um, breakdown for continual harvests here. Uh, summer planting veggies for continual harvest kind of helps break it down month by month, what you can plant like every week so that you can harvest every week. I can send you home with that. Or um, people online can email me if they want to copy. Uh, another thing to think about is crop rotation. <clears throat> crop rotation is extremely important in your vegetable garden, especially if you're gonna be planting there every year. It's something you have to think about in the long term. Um, and we'll break it down a little bit, ease a little more in a minute, but really it comes down to crop families and who's related to who, who's sharing diseases and who's sharing insects, who's eating what from the soil and how can we um, switch it out to keep the soil fresh and healthy and keep the pests off of everything. Um, I get a question, can onions be direct seeded or is it best to plant starts? I really like to direct seed onions. Their starts can be a little finicky and if you've seen them in the tray packs, they're very close together and kind of need to be thinned out. If you do from a set or a bulb, um, it's just one plant, no thinning really necessary <coughs> and no transplant, transplant shots included. Um, crop families for poor rotation. Rotate the family you grow every year. Try not to revisit for at least three years. Crop rotation for soil health and pest disease management. As I said, families share pests and diseases as well as um, eat similar nutrients out of, out of the soil at similar soil depths. So in the vegetable garden, you're gonna see six major families and we'll break them down and talk about them a little bit more. Um, I'm gonna take a little break. They asked for my email. Angelie at Shenards.com. So Ashton Casey is the first one we're gonna start with. This is also known as the daisy family. Um, you're gonna see similar growing structures on these things. Uh, lettuce seems a little different from a sunflower, but when they start to bolt and put their flowers up, you can kind of see how they seem a little more similar. Um, lettuce, artichoke, sunflowers, when they bloom, they put off this nice, beautiful uh, flower. 
Um, it's the highest number of species in all the plant families. So a lot of your weeds in the garden are gonna be similar to this family as well. They're characterized by that nice, big, beautiful flower head and petals um, and is most notably, is most notable during bolting, as I said. What is bolt? Oh, sorry. Whoops. Bolting is when it, so generally we like to eat the nice big leafy parts of the lettuce. Bolting is when it starts to shoot off a big stem through the middle to put flowers off. Um, and then the lettuce starts to become bitter and less palatable. And generally that's when the insects like to come and visit it as well. Basically when you go to seeds. Exactly. Okay. So do you so do you eat the last before it goes to seed, right? Yes. Okay. All right. And then brassicaceae, next family. These are going to be things like your broccoli, cabbages, mustards. We can also throw in here, they have their own family, but they're similar. Reddish, rutabaga, turnip. And what's really cool about these, some functional property is they have fumigative qualities in the soil. So you can kind of use it for pest management a little bit. Um, they're very stinky to the insects and even in the soil and it kind of discourages them from wanting to be around. We kind of know that smell a little bit. <laughs> um, so these things are characterized by their swollen tap roots and herbaceous woody stems which allows them to be hardier. A lot, if you noticed, a lot of these are more willing to live in those cold temperatures. Um, and yeah, they can break up cap compaction a little bit better than things with smaller fibrous roots. So that's another functional quality. So we usually find the summertime, you usually be done with your cabbage, right? I mean, if you started in March, is it usually ready to by the summer? Um, depending on what type of cabbage will determine, de, sorry, determine maturity rate. Um, I, I think a lot of people prefer to do cabbage in the winter just because of its uh, hardiness. Okay. And then also because it can tend to get insects yeah, in yeah. somewhere. Maybe some of that summer was horrible. <laughs> that doesn't mean you can't do it. Yeah. Um, it does suggest June, June to July. And it should be done. It says you can you can plant seeds June through July for harvest in August and September for summer crops. You can also then do harvest in September through February. So they're quite the they've got a So the cucurbit family is the cucumber gourd family. You'll find uh, cucumber melons and squashes in here. These guys tend to be quite heavy feeders with high need for nitrogen and a high need for water. A lot of them can be characterized by their climbing or their tendrils. As I mentioned, they climb very well. They uh, wish I had a better picture of their tendrils. They send off like little, you know, tiny little arms that literally just grab on and hold on. Uh, so some people like to trellis squash and cucumbers, but it requires a little bit of a heavier duty trellising system as they can get quite heavy. But it makes um, harvesting really easy because you can just rather than lean when, down, pick it up and it helps prevent when you trellis up these things, it helps prevent um, pest issues from it being on the ground. It helps prevent uh, moisture issues, uh, powdery mildew. Um, so sometimes it's good to use that to our advantage. How do you get started? I mean, we have these little cucumbers. And you know, little big gold yeah. I know, but do you put the trellis, you put it right beside it and just automatically go up? I mean, don't you have to kind of yeah, um, so they grab on really well. So if you just see it trying to go somewhere else, you just throw it back on the trellis and it eventually will just grab on. Okay. Okay. They don't take as much training as you might think. Uh, they, they grab on really well. 
the next family is the legume family. Peanuts, peas, and beans. These ones are really great to plant before heavy feeding plants like tomatoes or squash because they have nitrogen fixing rhizomes. Uh, they fix nitrogen in the soil, so they really benefit your soil um, from their relationship with bacteria and fungi. Um, soil is a living thing full of microorganisms, fungus, bacteria. So the idea is to keep things in a positive relationship in that ecosystem. And the legume family does a really good job of connecting healthy bacteria and healthy fungi to pull nitrogen from the air and put it into a usable form in the soil for your plant. The rose family, strawberries, raspberries, and blackberries belong in here. Um, these often, okay, sorry, heavy feeder examples. So heavy feeder, when I'm talking about heavy feeders, they want a lot of nitrogen and typically a lot of water as well. Um, a heavy feeder would be your squash, your um, tomatoes. They take, they've got that little bit of growing time to make a really big fruit, so. Um, Rose family lives long-term in the garden. They're very fragrant, delicious, and coupled with spines to try to deter herbivores as every part of the plant is edible mm -hmm. and delicious mm -hmm. and smells great. <laughs> uh, the Rose family uh, tends to share a lot of their issues with the tomato family. So those are two families you kind of want to keep on opposite sides of the spectrum. And that leads us into the Solanaceae family, which is the tomato or nightshade family. Here you'll find things like uh, potatoes, eggplants, and peppers. Um, someone asks, is there an option to grow strawberries vertically? Uh, strawberries do not climb like a squash or a melon would. However, you can build a system, a container that could grow vertically um, to do it that way. Um, so the nightshade family is particularly sensitive to viral diseases and pests, which is why we suggest using these guys in particular in a good crop rotation. Um, just an interesting fun fact, they are the most utilized fam you, the most utilized plant family, but also contains deadly plants <laughs> like belladonna and tobacco and capsaicin. All right. So when do I want to get started? So that just depends. Get started now, get started when you're watching this in the future, just any time of the year you can plant something. Um, just think about how temperature is a major factor for planting things. You're, you're not gonna be able to grow a tomato in January. Um, are you gonna wanna direct seed or you wanna gonna, are you gonna wanna start indoors? Uh, now's a great time to get started indoors. January through now is a great time to start things indoors to get them ready to go when the temperature turns and things actually start to warm up. So today we're gonna to talk about the tips and the tools that you can use for having good timing to get started now. First, we're gonna talk about direct seeding. Now's a difficult time for direct seeding as a lot of plants do not wanna germinate when the weather is below or the soil, not necessarily the weather, the soil temperature is below 50 degrees. Um, some, some seeds can take it, um, but most cannot. So I would like you to think about direct seeding as planting seeds directly into the soil of its final maturing space. Um, 
So germination, it takes to make the seed go from a seed to a plant, requires adequate temperatures, moisture, and sunlight after, and only sunlight after emergence. As you think, they don't need sunlight when they're under the soil. It's just that warm weather or temperature. Uh, spring temperature is the major limiting factor for direct seeding at this point in time, as most things will not germinate in that type of weather, they'll rot in the water before they can germinate. So most seeds will require soil temperature above 55. Um, planting anything before that can be a gamble, you can give it a go. Germination rates are going to be way down before that. Our last hard frost date is March 15th. So that means we're not likely to see another 10 degree night. But our last soft frost date, April 15th through May 15th, you know, we're likely, we are likely to see another 32 at least. Um, so I would always recommend when you're planting seeds to read the seed package for the soil temperature, soil depth, spacing, emergence date, and maturity date. And these seed packets will have everything you need written and directed on the back. Um, it says right here, ideally weather would be, or temperature would be 70 between 70 and 85. Clearly we're not gonna get that for a minute. <laughs> um, so that's a good, uh, provides a good opportunity to start things indoors where you can provide a heating mat or warm temperatures of the garage. Um, but here's an example on the right-hand side here of things that you can plant or try to direct seed during these times. And, you know, try. Like I said, germination rate is way down, but you can give it a go. Peas can maybe germinate in January, February. You can see things like onions, lettuce, radishes. March, you can start pushing your spinach, beets, potatoes, and chard. Early April, um, carrots, kale, cabbage, those are still pretty cold tolerant things. But then after that, you really wanna go past April to start seeing things like corn, cucumbers, melons, and squash. Those are really warm temperature crops that are really, really gonna demand that that soil is above that 55 degree point. And I've got, I've got lots of things here. So I've got a schedule for starting vegetables from seed inside, which we're gonna talk a little bit more about as well. Right now, indoor seeding. So this we're referring to starting seeds indoors with the intent to transplant them later outside. Some plants, don't necessarily like this. Like I mentioned earlier, onions can go through a transplant shock that they may not like. This doesn't mean you can't do that, but it just means you might get a better crop if you start before that. Germination requires, again, adequate temperatures and moisture, only sunlight post-emergence. So Adequate sunlight indoors is the major limiting factor of starting seeds or like after they've sprouted. You can find that they get really leggy, they start to fall over. This is because they're not getting enough sunlight. You, when you're starting seeds, you want to start in a sterile soil specifically for germination. A lot of this called, is called seed starting mix. This has been um, sterilized, so it's got no nutrients, it's got no weed seeds in particular. So you know that you're growing what you're trying to grow. This also means that after you see the true leaves, it's time to start fertilizing or getting them into some new soil because that seed starting mix has no nutrients and it's gonna start looking for nutrients at that point. Um, I've got, I think it breaks that down a little bit more but on the seed starting in jiffy pellets and seed starting in cell packs. So it can be a little tricky just because they get a little demanding. It's really easy to get a seed to germinate inside, you know, providing that temperature and moisture inside is quite easy. After it's poked out of that germination phase, it starts to get a little more demanding. So to the right here is that um, 
handout, I have your schedule for starting vegetables inside. So on the left-hand side, start inside during this time. Uh, March in particular, start your eggplants and your tomatoes. Those are those warm seasoned. Um, and then to plant out during six weeks later. Breaks it down pretty easy. So here's some tips and tools I would like to suggest. Greenhouses help tremendously. They increase the humidity and temperature. Um, not all of us can have greenhouses. Um, but I might also suggest then using soil covers or dark fabrics to try to preheat your raised beds or your ground to get ready for your warm season crops like your tomatoes and your melons. You can amend your soils uh, for desired texture. A lot of plants when they're um, trying to break germination want really nice fluffy soil because if they're trying to break through a compacted soil, it can cause some stunt, some stunting, um, which I think I have a slide talking a little bit more about amending. Uh, in here, I might also throw amending for um, pH. I would suggest testing pH for your native soils if you're not using things like potting soil. We've got a really cool test here um, that makes it pretty instant. And if you find you need to amend either to make it more acidic or more basic, you can use things like lime to raise your pH or sulfur um, slash acid planting mixes to lower the pH. Right now, a really good tool to have in your pocket is things like the remaze and cloches. Um, I've got a picture on here as well as some examples right there. I really like the bell cloches. You can also make your own out of milk jugs, cut the milk jugs up. This will help prevent frost from getting on things like your lettuces right now. Lettuces are pretty cold hardy. However, they don't like to be frosted on or protect them from heavy rain, which we also might see at this time. Uh, seed supplies. Uh, I've got a picture of a light here. Um, like I said, light can be very hard to provide for your new seeds indoors. Alrighty, so now we're going to talk a little bit more about how do I actually plant it. We're going to not be afraid to get dirty. We're not going to be afraid to fail. We're going to push through and we're going to learn. And in the end, we're going to let that pride really set in. Talk a little bit about soil preparation, winter cleaning, uh, get rid of your old decaying leaves, all of your weeds you find. Uh, this is a good way to reduce pests and diseases. If you're doing cover crops, thinking about tilling them in or pulling them, what, whatever you gotta do, be careful to pay attention to timing when you're using cover crops, as you don't wanna let things like red clover go to seed in your vegetable garden. Think about what soils you're using, uh, the differences between native soils versus raised beds slash containers. Um, the soil from that I'm using in my containers is potting soil. It's chock full of perlite, it's chock full of nutrients. Uh, the native soils and it, the potting soil doesn't hold water at all. I have to water my containers every day in the dead of summer. However, native soil is chock full of nutrients as well. However, it's got high clay content, which makes it extremely hard for those plants to access the nutrient content. Uh, it's very selfish and wants to hold on to all that nutrient content for itself. So we wanna add things like organic matter and materials into the native soil to help break it up and help release it to the plants. Another really great thing about our native soils is it holds water really, really well. And sometimes this can be to our detriment. Things root rot really well. So um, consider mounding up helps a lot of plants so that the water can uh, slough off to the side and go elsewhere versus um, sometimes when we plant compaction happens, 
and then the water can collect in here and saturate the feet of your plants, which nobody likes saturated feet. Um, so when you're thinking about your types of soils, you wanna think about how you wanna change the qualities to increase drainage, change your pH, uh, retain moisture retention and nutrients. I know I, in my containers, I like to apply a heavy, thick, uh, compost mulch to the top of my containers. Uh, the purely compost we have here that's already composted down to help increase my nutrients as well as my moisture retention in my pots. Can you do the same thing on your beds too? Absolutely. Can you do things on top? You don't mix them in? Uh, yes, yes. Yeah. Uh, you can mix them in to help increase the general soil, but also mulching is highly recommended for most things in a one or two inch layer at the top. This helps prevent weed seeds, it helps prevent pests and diseases, and it helps increase moisture retention. I've also heard that worm castings help push pests. If worm castings are a really great nutrient adding for micronutrients of plants. So I would think if it's got pest um, prevention qualities, it's more of like creating an extremely healthy plant as extremely healthy plants fight pests and diseases actively versus a sad, unhealthy plant is more likely to be attacked. So would it be beneficial to use both worm castings and uh, a layer of mulch? Yeah, I don't see why not. Um, yeah, it's great. It's just added nutrients. There's a lot of micronutrients in worm castings that you might not find in say like a a granular form fertilizer. Um, doo -doo -doo -doo. Mounding, I mentioned, oops, off track. I mentioned mounding as it increases drainage and allows you to apply a nice layer of mulch to it. Uh, soil temperatures is really important. Um, as native soils in, in ground are gonna be slower to warm up than my container pots in a black pot. So you can do things, so you gotta think about the environmental factors influencing your soil and think about how you can maybe manipulate it. Maybe if you've got a native bed with lots of native soils that's in ground, you can throw that black fabric over it to start warming it now to get ready. Because my container, Pots, I can tell you that on a day like today, they're already warm and my plants are getting ready to go. So I'm gonna talk a little bit more about native soils versus raised beds. Again, native soil in our area is high in clay and nutrients, often too great for moisture retention. But the really great thing about planting in your native soils is there's less temp temperature fluctuations. While it may, may take longer to warm up, it's not gonna warm up to 103 degrees in the summer. It's gonna stay a little cool because it's got the, the ground keeping it cool, whereas my black pots are gonna be fried come summer. <laughs> um, they might, yeah, take a little longer to warm up, but the fluctu fluctuations are minimal. They create, a native soil creates natural reservoir for water and nutrients. Plants are able to scavenge out and look for water and nutrients in their surroundings um, in the native soil, whereas my container beds, they get what they get. Um, raised, pet, raised beds and pots are 100% dependent of their inputs. So we have to be mindful of what we're putting in there and what we're taking out. And investing in our soil is always great. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about these valuable amendments. Soil, it's always great to splurge on your soil, especially if you're planting in rice beds or containers. We've got the seacoast compost on the top right is our newest type of soil. It's made out of Coos Bay, out of uh, lots of uh, sea rich, materials, crab shells, oyster shells. And I really like it in, for, as a soil for my growing plants in my containers. It's a lot more expensive, but it's totally worth it. Um, 
soil amendments to help increase the drainage slash moisture retention of your soil. We like to recommend things like the soil building conditioner and as it uh, is a good alternative to things like peat. It helps drainage as well as moisture retention. Acid planting mix does the great thing, same thing, but it also slowly acidifies your soil in the surrounding areas, which makes it really great thing like for, for things like blueberries, camellias, and rhododendrons. Mulch, I would highly recommend mulching pretty much everything all the time. It reduces weeds, increases moisture, uh, reduces pests and disease pressure. You can use things like soil building conditioner, purely compost, which I like to use the compost. Bark mulch, I'm less inclined as sometimes it can have a nitrogen negative um, uh, tendency. And then straw mulch you can also use. However, I like to stay away from it as it doesn't have any added like soil benefits really. Yes, it'll keep uh, weed pressure down, it'll keep moisture retention, but it's not gonna do much for helping build up your soil as a compost would. Adjusting pHs, sulfur low, slowly lowers pH and acid planting mix will also as well. You can use things like lime to raise it. When you're using sulfur, I would recommend being careful. Too much too soon is just, just stay on the slower slide when you're using sulfur. And I would maybe recommend using an acid planting mix or an acid fertilizer instead. Fertilizers can be plant specific um, or all purpose works pretty much on anything. Acidic leaning fertil fertilizers will slowly acidify your soil and things geared towards blooming will be great for annual um, flowers and whatnot. However, I might stay away from them for your vegetable garden and just go with the tomato er herb fertilizer. As we mentioned earlier, you don't want things necessarily blooming in the vegetable garden. You don't want the seeds going everywhere and you don't want your plants to be encouraged to bolt. We just want that nice big green growth. So we're gonna talk a little bit about direct seeding. I mentioned a little bit earlier, they like moist, fluffy, soft soils to poke out through. So pay attention to seeding times as some can handle colder temperatures than others. Some will just rot in the ground before they're able to germinate. Always read the seeding instructions on the packet, plant to the appropriate depths and spacings as you, it might, Die, again, die and rot before it's able to breathe this, reach the surface if you plant it too deep. Always be sure to water in your new plantings as they need that 100% moisture to germinate. And as you're direct seeding, be aware of cold snaps. We're likely to see more cold, extremely cold days. Burying too deep as it will just rot. Seeding too close, that's not the worst thing in the world. You're just gonna have to go through and thin them out. Um, and then germination rate and thinning. Some things you can expect most seeds to germinate, but not all of them. Uh, most of the time they will tell you the germination rate at this perfect temperature. Indoor seeding can be just a little bit trickier slash transplanting. So this is gonna be the things that you might see in our, gar our greenhouse that you can purchase for sale for vegetables in the little six packs, or you may have already, or you're gonna get ready to do it yourself with tray packs or different pots. It's a good way to get a head start and not all plants will like transplanting. Like I mentioned, onions can be a little picky. Oh, it looks like I've got some messages, sorry. What pH is good for vegetables? You want very, uh, right down the middle. Okay, what they call that. Not acidic and not basic, you just want it. Neutral, that's the word I'm looking for. <laughs> I'm 
31 degrees Saturday and Sunday nights this weekend. Yes. So we're getting ready for the cold. We're right in the middle of everything. So it's easy to get ahead of yourself when the weather looks as good as it does today. Um, so when you're burying your transplants, you want to plant at the level that it is in the tray packs. Don't bury it any deeper. Don't bury it any shallower. Uh, and compact the soil around the starts so that the soil can touch it all and support the roots as it grows. And remember to always water them in as they are going to be going through some sort of transplant shock. Some take it a little better than others, um, but the water will really help soothe them as they get used to their new home. So how do I maintain it? Um, it's easy to get it in the ground, but making it live is a little more tricky. Um, do. Weeding is a big part of this. It's a constant chore in the garden, but healthy soil equals healthy plants, which means the weeds will want to be there too. If you're doing your gardening right, you're going to have some weeds. Um, keep plants and weeds at least six inches away from your, vegetable, your vegetables as they don't want to compete for root space, nutrients, or water. This means things like your guard or your lawn as well. In the case of a vegetable bed, your lawn is considered a weed at this point, so keep it away. Make sure to mulch around two inches. This will keep the weeding uh, chore down as well. And drip irrigation is also a really good option in the garden as they are going to be competing for water. So if you can keep the water localized to just your plant that you're trying to keep healthy, the weeds are going to die from thirst. Uh, drip irrigation is really good for um, water use as well. It's a water-wise um, conservation. It's good for water conservation. If you look at the numbers, the water, it, the amount of water it takes for a sprinkler head versus drip irrigation, the numbers are way different and it, you use a lot less water in drip irrigation. And it also helps the native bees. Um, as a lot of our native bees nest in the ground, if you're flooding all of it, you might be flooding their home. So if you do just drip irrigation, that gives up some soil space for the bees. Big fan of drip irrigation. Fertilizing schedule. So it's highly important for vegetables as they have just a really small growing window for such really high yields, ideally. So I would recommend using a balanced granular uh, at planting, which is kind of the, the option I have here on my table. These are slow release fertilizers that will be useful to the plant throughout the whole growing season. Um, you may want a second application after a certain period of time. I think it suggests 50 days. Um, and early, late plantings will benefit from liquid in addition to granular as it is a more fast release granular, for, or liquid is. And but the trick is it doesn't really work unless we're in the growing season. As I said, if the soil temperature is below 50, 55 degrees, not a lot of plants are doing a lot of active growing. So the quick release liquid fertilizer is less useful during those periods. So you wanna to stick to using the liquid when we're in our active growing season. Watering needs, uh, vegetables are extremely thirsty. Native soils hold water well and will need water nearly around two or three times a week in the summer, much clearly much less in the spring. Now it's all dependent on what's coming from the sky. Uh, raised beds will need more frequent watering as they're gonna have a lot more well-draining material in them. Different crops in different soils are going to have different watering needs. So it's hard to provide a 
general rule of thumb as it's depending on what you're growing, it's dependent on what soil you're using and what you're growing it in. But I can tell you as a general rule of thumb to keep the water off the leaves. Um, this will help prevent disease and physical damage because as the sun starts to come out, the water can act as a magnifying glass and just scorch the leaves of the plants. And it helps prevent powdery mildew and other things like that. Again, recommending drip irrigation, it's efficient. You can use a timer, set it and forget about it. Um, and it just, again, prevents disease like powdery and mildew. As we're talking about pests and disease, it's pretty much a given you're gonna run into them in the garden. You wanna eat it, they wanna eat it too. <laughs> Um, you're going to likely see things like aphids, slugs, and beetles. I would recommend using Captain Jacks for aphids and beetles and using Sluggo for slugs. I've got a few options over there on the far end of the table. I've also heard that copper tape works really well, that the slugs don't like to cross the copper barrier. Um, slugs are pretty much a given in our area, so just plan to have them and have the tools in your tool belt that you need to battle them and maybe create some deterrence. Um, filbert shells, egg shells, makes the surface of the soil a lot more abrasive and a lot less pleasant for slugs to zoom around on. You're likely to run into some animal issues. I would recommend using physical barriers, uh, automatic sprinklers or bird tapes to kind of make it a less desirable area. Uh, you can also use chemical deterrents, things like bone meal, which is creates an unpleasant smell to your whole area. Um, and then capsaicin sprays. So the bone meal will make your whole area un unpleasing to the animal. But if he still comes and he wants to go take a bite of your leaf, he takes a bite of it and it's hot from the hot capsaicin sprays, he'll file it in his brain that your plants are spicy and he doesn't want to eat from your garden. You might also run into fungal diseases. Powdery mildew is very common around our area. Uh, remove, it's just easiest to remove leaves, the sickest leaves off the plant. And then consider using a fungicide. Um, we can help you pick the right one, depending on what season you're growing in is what depending on what you're going to want to use for powdery mildew. Viral diseases are very tricky with vegetables and pretty much if you've identified a viral disease in your vegetable, it's already done for. So prevention is key always. Crop rotation is going to be one of your biggest friends and always read chemical instructions before you use them. Be mindful of your local pollinators and your honeybees and your hummingbirds. You can, if you use things incorrectly, you can murder them. <clears throat> so planning next steps. You've gone through everything, you've battled your pests, your diseases, and you've come out with your great giant harvest. What are you gonna do going forward? So you're gonna think about maturity dates. What open spaces are you gonna have in 60 days? What can you look forward to? Um, we got things to look forward to like tomatoes and melons now. We're getting a really excited point in our planning steps. Really reflect on what worked, what issues you had, what you liked, and, what, and think about what you planted so you can think about crop rotations. Um, if you're having issues, you're trying to plant your tomato in that one spot every year and it just won't go there, probably because you just need some fresh soil in a new location. Um, so if you can't figure out why you're having the issues you're having, feel free to contact us. I really get a kick out of helping people figure out their problems and helping them be successful. But crop rotation is the biggest thing I can hand off on to you today. Prevention is key. We can't see what's going on in our soil, but it is key for the health of our plants. So I'd like to say thank you for joining me today. If you'd like more information, you can find these handouts and information on our Chenard website. We've got previous classes on our YouTube page. 
um, where we post them uh, a couple weeks after presenting them. We've got a really cool one coming up on soil uh, with the soil science teacher at OSU, James Cassidy. I'm extremely excited about that one. Um, and feel free to email us with any questions you have at this email address here. If you have any questions, don't hesitate to ask now or post them on here or have a conversation afterwards. So thank you all for coming. We really appreciate it. Thank you. <laughs> oh, yeah. Thank you. Also, handouts if you'd like handouts. Yeah, that one's mine. And if you, you want to buy the calendar, it's available out front. Thank you. Yeah, on the seat, can you only use them the year you buy them? Like you can't use them. Um, we can't sell them after that year, but the germination rate just goes down. You can still use them, it's just the germination rate. Is that on the sheet right now? Yeah, it's all. Uh, so I do have a question. Yeah. So I was trying to um so when you say rotation, so I had carrots, <laughs> real interesting on it, carrots, tomatoes, <laughs> and cucumbers. <laughs> All in one bed. All in one bed. Okay. And the yeah. tomatoes and stuff did and the cucumbers still in this. So the cabbage I did in the summer, so we got a lot of bugs and stuff. So yeah. I can do that. Yeah. But the question I have, I bought a different saw that you guys support the GP and stuff. And so when I went and when they were done, I pulled everything up, everything out, got rid of everything, all the old plants that let them sit in there and everything. But when I went today, um, when I went to break it up, just getting it ready or just doing something, it was like in real chunks. Mm -hmm. But it had like white. Whoa. Is that what it is? I, yeah, it is, but it's not bad. Well, it's good. Okay. Oh, it's good. Well. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Because I was wondering, I was like, what was it? Okay. Okay. So I just started breaking it up because it was like in chunks yeah. because of the bark and all yeah. that stuff. Like that. Okay. Yeah. All right. You're right on track. Okay. You can, now's a good time to be adding things to kind of help fluffing it up too, maybe like some compost. Or, okay. You can break it up with that in there. Okay. So last okay. year we got kind of. And we're just really heavy. Uh, our tomatoes didn't, we didn't get hardly any of the large tomatoes. We got all we the cherry tomatoes. cherry tomatoes and everything, but not the large ones, but they grew real big. So when I went through real big, they didn't have any tomatoes on them. Did they get the black scabbing on them by chance? No, they just didn't have any tomatoes on them. When I got the tomatoes, she said, oh, plant these real deep. When I got them from the spice, mm -hmm. so I planted them real deep, and man, they it really went. And so all these leaves and everything. And so by that time, I think the tomatoes didn't have time because it was so focused on all the leaves and stuff that grew. Yeah. So I I just thought this time if they get a lot of stuff, I don't know, maybe they cut some of them. I don't know. It just had so much greenery. Yeah. And yeah. It was taken, and no I think they was taken from the tomato. Yeah. Yeah, it can do that. Um, I mean, we got some, but not nowhere near the side. That plant was like that big with four. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, not many tomatoes. tomatoes. Maybe, it was, maybe it was just the plant. Not a bad. So. Maybe fertilizing too. You know, it takes a lot to make those big ones. Yeah. The little ones I find to be a little easier. Yeah. Because yeah. um, I was, I was putting tomato. Um, fertilizing on them, but I wasn't doing it that frequent. I would, you know, maybe once every two months. And I, 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 I think we overworked. Yeah, we did overwork. That, yeah, that can be a problem with yeah, tomatoes. Yeah, yeah, I, yeah, I know we did. We overworked them. Okay. All right. Thank you, Molly. Thank you. Thank you. You're so, welcome. Thank, thank you for so coming. Much. So, do you guys have cabbage or onion? Yep. Yep. We got lots of vegetables. It starts out. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, it was beautiful. They had so many bugs. It was awful. We got cabbage, but we don't get the hair. Again, another thing, they had too much water. Yeah. Yeah, that's a balance. Um, yeah. So, how do you read these things? 
I mean, that's why I had, I we got one. My son got me something, and and it was, but his was yeah, this, right. his was the stick, the stick thing that goes to show. Oh yeah, yeah, those things are hard yeah. to read, and I could make sense of it. No, it wasn't that easy to read because he was having a hard time explaining it to me. So, but these right here, would you just put the soul in here? Oh, well, I mean, how do you do this? I believe it's a, there's like a mixture that you're going to mix up and mix in with the soil. Mm -hmm. And then it's going to, then you'll stick the stick in there. Oh, okay. And it'll change the color of the stick. To whatever it is. Okay. Okay. Yeah, that's what I, I yeah, to see how, what I need, what. All right. I pulled it, put it in my pocket, right? <laughs> thank, thank you. you. Yeah, thank you. All right, I'm going to double check questions here. It looks like someone asks, how do I get rid of fungus gnats? That's like an indoor houseplant question. There's a few different ways. A lot of people like to use diatomaceous earth. We recommend using these things called uh, mosquito bits. Uh, my boss tends to really find those to work really well with the fungus gnats, and that's just something you sprinkle on the soil and water in. The diatomaceous earth provides a physical barrier for them to have to pass through and kind of shred them up a little bit. Do we sign up for the soil webinar on our website? So unfortunately, we already sold out a seat for a soil webinar. However, I do believe we're going to be posting it on our YouTube maybe a week or two after we get it um, videoed. So I'm not allowed to go because it's on the day of work but I'm gonna still watch it once it comes available on our YouTube. Did the chance of fungus, I just did. Uh, fungus nets, what about sand? Sand might also provide a, a barrier, but it's not gonna be as abrasive as like diatomaceous earth is going to be. Um, another thing, fungus nets, some people like to um, dry them out. They'll find the fungus, Plant gnats will die before the plant does, but that's a gamble. Mosquito dunks are the only thing that worked for them. Again, that's the mosquito bits. So I, I find they're really successful. A lot of our um, houseplant lovers really love the mosquito bits. Catching them with vinegar, but they read like mad. Yeah, the problem, you can control the adults all day long, but the problem is the larval stages in the soil. So they've got babies in the soil, so overwatered, yeah, that happens. <laughs> um, yeah, I'd recommend using multiple, multiple um, avenues for getting rid of them because they're so prevalent. I would use the mosquito bits, the diatomaceous earth, and then even maybe let your plant dry out a little extra between watering. And that should help it, that should get it done. Any more questions? She just dissolved the dunk in the water, yeah, and then watered it in. Good point. Uh, another thing is soil choice, I think, with the fungus net. Since I've switched to the higher quality seacoast compost soil, I have not seen any fungus nets in my house. The one plant I planted in a different kind of soil is the one plant that I actually had fungus gnats in. So I have completely switched over to the Seacoast compost. It's like $25 a bag for one cubic feet, but it's totally worth it. Investing in your soil is always a great idea in the vegetable garden and in your house plants. Started dragon fruit from the one she bought at the grocery store. Ooh, yeah, that's pretty cool. They're pretty cold sensitive. So make sure to keep it in the house or in a greenhouse while we're really cold. But feel free to let it vacation outside in the summer once we warm back up. But beware once it turns fall, it's not gonna like the cold. Maybe getting it to fruit might be a little difficult too. It might not like our summers, our summers are just not quite hot enough for something. It takes years, yeah. Gonna have to treat that baby. 
Oh, Texas, tech, living in Texas will make it a little easier to keep it warm. You guys, uh, you guys are pretty much already on spring. We're just leaving winter around here. We've got one of our first beautiful days today. Uh, Monday it was coming down, but today it's absolutely gorgeous. We got any more questions left here? I appreciate you all come for coming. I really do. Um, a lot of these handouts are available on our website. Again, email me if you saw a specific one that you didn't can't find on the internet. Uh, on our website, up at the top, we have a resources button on the top right that'll drop down, I believe, for handouts. And in that handouts page, I think you go to other plants and it will have some more information. All righty. Okay. With that being said, I think I'm going to exit out this Zoom meeting. I appreciate you all for coming. If you have any questions, feel free to give us a call at the store, send me a personal email, or just explore on our YouTube page. It's chock full of classes that have lots of great information. Thank you all so much. Appreciate you. Have a great rest of your day. Enjoy spring gardening out there.